Let us turn our Bibles to 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 to 27. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But ye have an unction from the Holy One. And ye know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth. But because ye know it. And that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Let that there be, sorry, let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. Verses 25 to 27. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. And ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things. And is truth. And is no lie. And even as it has taught you, ye shall abide in him. Let me begin the exposition of this passage by telling you that the message of this passage is our safeguard against antichrists. The reason why God is interested in safeguarding us is because he is a God who passionately Loves his children. Whom he redeemed. By the blood of his son. God loves us. That's a great truth that we all believe in. He's a loving God. And his love is eternal. One of the characteristics of God's love. Toward each of us. Is its protectiveness. God's love protects it's always committed to safeguard us. Let me give you some quick examples. Let me remind you what Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 28. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Because of his great love, he laid down his life to give us eternal life. And once he does redeem us from sin and take us for himself, he will never let anyone pluck us out of his hand. He is very protective of us. How wonderful it is to know that our souls are safe in his arms. Safe in the arms of Jesus. Even our arch enemy, the cruel, wicked devil, cannot do anything. In fact, uh, in John 10, 28, when Jesus said, Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. The word man uh, is in italics that is to suggest that it was not there. In fact, the translation can be, Neither shall any one pluck you. Anyone can mean even the devil. Not only mankind. No creature can ever take us from the power of God's love. 
You know, Jesus prayed in John 17, a long prayer, which is known as pastoral prayer of Christ or high priestly prayer of Christ. Would you like to hear what Jesus prayed? Here is just a small portion of it. John 17, 15. And if you listen to that prayer carefully, you would easily figure this out, that his love for us craves to see that we are protected at all times. You see how he prays in love for us. He said, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from evil. How wonderful. That thou shouldest keep them from the evil. The Lord is able to keep us. And he will keep us. As long as we remain close to Christ, our Savior, no evil will betide us. You know, sometimes some of us get burned. We get troubled by, by sins. That's because we drift away from him. We try to venture through ways that God would not allow us to go. And that's very dangerous. That's where we have all the trouble. So in today's passage, we see that protective love of God expressing itself through the words of the Apostle John. You know, his love is seen in the fact that we are called little children at the beginning of verse 18. Look at that. This passage begins with this compassionate, loving address. Little children. That includes old folks as well as young children in our midst. In the sight of the eternal God, the ancient of days, we are all young children. Little children, he calls us. How tenderly he addresses us today. And then you would immediately see in verse 18 that his love tenaciously assure us that he will protect us from the enemies, namely Antichrist. It is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. And he warns us against them. Since the Lord's love has warned us of the Antichrist, we must take a close look at these enemies of God and his people. Let me explain to you the dangers of Antichrist. Now this is not a myth. It's a reality. Apostle Paul has done everything to prove their reality to us. So let's take a closer look at the reality of the presence and existence of this group of men identified as Antichrist. Now it begins by telling us in verse 18, It is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Now here we are told that the outstanding feature of the last days is the advent of Firstly, the Antichrist, and then many Antichrists. Please take note of these two, two titles here. The Antichrist and many Antichrists. And these are the two names that John has brought to our attention as people who will enter the church and cause trouble to the believers. Now he talks about the reality in this way. If you look into that verse again, he says, It is the last time. You know the word last time does not mean this is the last minute or last second. In the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 2 verse 2 and Micah chapter 4 verse 1 predicts the messianic age 
that's the New Testament period, as the last days. Now, if you read the New Testament carefully, in Acts chapter 2, you see when Apostle Peter tried to explain the events that happened on the day of Pentecost, he quoted from Joel's prophecy, saying these are the things that would happen in the last days. So the apostles believed that they were living in the last days. So 2,000 years ago, when Jesus was here on earth, the period known as the last time or the last days began. Let me give you another example. If you can, please quickly turn to the epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. Let's take a quick look at that. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. Well, in verse 1, the writer tells us about God revealing His truth in the Old Testament through prophets. And then he says in verse 2 of Hebrews chapter 1, "...hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son." whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Take note, it says, in the last days, spoken to us by his Son. So when Jesus started speaking and teaching the truth here on earth, it was already what? Last days. So, as I told you a while ago, last time, by the way, in Greek text, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, the word for time is horror from which we get hour. Uh, it is not to talk about one specific hour, but it is a name that God has given to the period that begins with the first advent of Christ to the second advent of Christ. This whole period is known in the Bible as last days. But we are living in the last of last days. You understand that? We are living in the last of last days. So many of the things that are predicted in the Bible about the last days, the last, last hour of the last days, are now happening in the world. God willing, we will have some other occasion to study the concept of time as God has revealed it in the Bible. But for the time being, it will be sufficient to notice that the term last days here, or last time, here refers to this whole period of church age, New Testament church age. Now moving forward, please take note that Apostle John clearly says at the end of verse 18, look again, at the end of verse 18, whereby we know that it is the last time. So the existence of the Antichrist teaches us this is the last time. Now the word anti tells you that something is opposing something, right? Antichrist means things or people who oppose Christ. Antichrist. So it's interesting. Last time is supposed to be the time when Jesus' presence will be known to the people and more of his truth will be known to the people. More people will come to Christ. So the last hour or last time or last day is a period when Messiah will be magnified. Nonetheless, this will also be a time when Antichrist will multiply. So coming of Christ is not the only thing that proves to us that we are in the last times but also the existence of Antichrist. You know, please don't be troubled because of the fact that today churches are plagued with false teachers or false Christ because this is part and parcel of God's plan for this world. And we are told to be careful we are told not to be an antichrist and also not to fall into their traps. Now we want to be a little bit more careful in our understanding of this warning. So let's look at their identification. We just 
establish their reality in the fact that these are the last days and therefore Antichrist will be present even in the church, even in our congregation. It's best for each of you to ask, am I an Antichrist? Wait, we will soon identify them. And when the features, the distinguishing characteristics of Antichrist are made known to you, it's good to check whether you are one. Let's don't be presumptuous. If there's any resemblance in any regard, then let's repent quickly. Lest we will be called Antichrist. As I told you a while ago, there are two groups which are mentioned here. The first, the Antichrist. Look again into verse 18. It says, as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. And then he goes on to say that even now are there are there are many Antichrists. So see, there are two groups. The Antichrist shall come, and then now are there many Antichrists. So there is one person who is called the Antichrist who shall come, who was not there at the time of John. He's still not here yet. Maybe somewhere, I'm not sure. He may be coming up, but not yet fully revealed to us. And I want to talk a little bit about this Antichrist. Again, our time would not, would not permit us to go into a detailed study of the Antichrist. God willing, another occasion we will do that as soon as possible. Nonetheless, I want to quickly mention some things about who is the Antichrist as we try to identify him. This is the prominent figure that will rise up in the seven years of great tribulation that will soon come upon the earth. This world will face what the scripture calls the great wrath of God. For seven years, and we believe in this truth being a premillennial church. Now, here are some other names that Bible has for him. By the way, this is a brief summary. These are not all the details about the Antichrist. And I'm going to show you six major names that the Bible has for the Antichrist that is about to be revealed. In Daniel chapter 7, he is re referred to as the little horn. It's part of a vision that God has given. In chapter 11 of Daniel, he is called the willful king, who is very self-willed, ferocious king. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 3, Paul calls him the man of sin. In 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3 again, this man is called the son of perdition. In 2 Thessalonians 2.8, Paul calls him the wicked one. And in Revelation, in fact, in several chapters, he is called the beast. The beast that will come out of the sea. The sea that represents the sea of humanity. And these are the various names that the Bible has for the Antichrist. Now let me give you some more facts about the Antichrist in the Bible. I will try to do this as quickly as possible. It's very interesting and you better know this because it's the truth of the Bible. Listen carefully. He will be a genius among men. Probably one unique man. Of course Christ who took the form of man was infinitely greater than this. Nonetheless if you just took, take men, human beings alone, then this one will be one outstanding person. Intellectually, he will be a genius person. According to chapter 11 of Daniel, verse 36, he will be a very eloquent man. He will be genius oratorically. He will also be a genius politically. He will maneuver himself through all the political chaos that the world is now seeing. 
and come to the top of it. Commercially, he will be a genius. Militarily, he will be a genius. Religiously, he will be a genius. Now, let me explain very quickly what these are. Now, listen to his political and military maneuvers. I'm going to just list them very quickly. It will not appear on the screen, but you can quickly capture this in your mind, if you can. Politically and militarily, these are the things he's going to achieve, according to the Bible. He will begin by controlling the Western power bloc. The European countries will be under him. This is clearly explained uh, not only by Daniel, but also by John in Revelation chapter 17. Maybe you can check verse 12 later. Now, he will make a seven-year covenant with Israel, but will break it after three and a half years. That's found in Daniel 9.27. Now, American President Bush is trying so desperately to make a treaty between Israel and Palestine. Everybody's saying it's not going to happen. Well, what will it be? Some people ask me, is Bush an antichrist? Uh, do you think Obama is the one? Is it John McCain? Now, it's not for me to predict. The Lord knows. We will see when the real picture unveils itself. But for the time being... These are the things we must keep in mind. He will also attempt to destroy all of Israel, according to Revelation 12. You know, Israel has a powerful military. No country on earth dare to challenge them. It's very hard. Of course, Hezbollah is quite uh, uh, proud in the fact that they ward them off in the recent war. But they got beaten up very hard, too. They agreed for truce. Well, it's not easy to fight against Israel, but Antichrist will attempt to destroy. The whole description is found in Zechariah chapter 12 to 14. He will even rule over all nations, though it will be for a short time. It's explained in Daniel chapter 11 and Revelation 13. Now let me just point out some of the religious maneuvers he will make. Very interesting. I'm going to list them very quickly. Antichrist will do everything according to his own selfish will. He is God. So he is God. Okay, so the world is preparing for this idea of Antichrist theology. I'm God. That's why you have self-esteem business going on everywhere. Believe in yourself. He will not regard the God of his father, Daniel 11, 37. He will not have the desire for women. Very interesting. 11, 37, he appeared to be like a monk, I think. <laughs> and then, the Bible says he, his God will be a God of power. He will not seek after God of Israel, a God of the Bible. He will seek after some kind of deity that is known among men as a sort of, sort of God of power. He will destroy powerful religious systems so that he may rule unhindered. And you know, some of the religious systems in the world are very powerful. You agree? Roman Catholic Church. They are militarily powerful. They are political system, though they are religious. And the Antichrist will go against them. It's in Revelation 17. He will be a master of deceit, according to 2 Thessalonians 2.10. He will teach all the wicked doctrines in a deceitful way. And Matthew chapter 24 verse 15 tells us he will profane the temple of the Jews. Well, that's something going to happen in Israel sooner or later. Israel will build their own temple. Now there is no temple, but it will come up. I believe so. He will set himself up as God. This is predicted so many times in the scriptures. Daniel 11, 36 and 37. Second Thessalonians 2, 4. Then Revelation chapter 13, verse 5. He will call himself God. He will be energized by Satan. That's his religion. You know, he will be able to do miracles. He will do amazing things to attract people to himself. Where, does he get it? Where will he get this power? From the devil himself. Revelation 13, 2 talks about it clearly. That's the character that John said 
the Antichrist shall come. He's coming. He's on the way. The world is preparing for this great world leader. Everything is moving that direction. So when you see all these political changes and upheavals, don't panic. You know, quite a number of people kept asking me in recent days, Pastor, who will be the president of America? You know, I don't know why. People think I have all this knowledge. Uh, I don't know. But who it would be, I know one thing. The person whom God would permit will be there, and he will be working to get the Antichrist where he's supposed to be. Whether he will be the Antichrist or whether he will prepare the room for him, I do not know. We will see. Time will prove it. But we have enough things to know where we are in relationship to all these unveiling of Antichrist that is going on around us. Anyway, it is important for you to know he's, he's not going to last forever. Our Lord Jesus will come according to Revelation 19. And there we are told clearly in the battle of Armageddon, our Lord will crush the Antichrist. And one more thing, according to Revelation 19.20, Antichrist will be the first creature who will be thrown into the lake of fire. Interesting. So his destruction is imminent, and it is sure. Our Lord reigns supreme. Now look at the next name we have, many antichrists. Even now are there many antichrists. They are here. That's why I told you a while ago, let's take care that we are not one of them. They are here. Let's look at the characteristics of the antichrists that are present in our time. Apostle John gives us three distinctive characteristics. The first one is found in verse 19. And the first characteristic of antichrists in the church is that they disassociate themselves with the apostolic band. They go away from the apostolic truth. This is how he says in verse 19. Please look into your Bible. They went out from us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. How clear is that statement? You see, John is saying, people who disassociated themselves from the apostles, the word us, the pronoun us, in that verse refers to the apostles. The readers, the believing readers are referred to as e in second person plural, plural pronoun. Antichrist is referred to as antichrist. So, Whenever the word us appears here, it's a reference to the apostles. They are the ones whom God has appointed to lay the foundation of the church. So to leave the men whom God appointed to lay the foundation is to have a new foundation on their own. Other than God is laying through the apostles. So he says, one of the characteristics of the Antichrist within the church is that they will disassociate themselves. And the reason why they will disassociate is because they disapprove the faith and the spiritual pedigree of the apostles. They don't agree that the apostolic faith is of God. That's why Apostle Paul said, if they had been of us, then they would have been with us, they would have continued with us. If they, if they had been of us. In other words, if they have really believed what we have preached. Then they would have continued with us. The reason why they leave is because they did not believe in, us, in what we have preached. And this is an important truth even today. I'm not an apostle. But if I preach the apostolic doctrines correctly, I believe all those who are genuinely children of God would also stick with me. 
well we may have some disagreements on one point or another but basically we will be ready to acknowledge one another as Christians now though I said it is not always difficult I mean it's not always easy to figure this out you see there are people who leave our church or other Bible believing churches and uh, when they leave one church for the other, we cannot call them Antichrist. Can we? Cannot. Because some of them are true believers. And sometimes Christians who backslide also would leave a church for a time. They may return to their own church or they may go to another church of the same truth after their return. So not everybody who goes out of the church must be called Antichrist. So Apostle Paul gives us even clearer distinguishing mark of the Antichrist. That's the second one. And you find that in verse 22 and verse 23. Look at that. The second mark of those who are truly Antichrist, who leave the church, are those who deny the truth of Christ and his Father. This is how it is said. Who is a liar but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denied the Father and the Son. Whosoever denied the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledged the Son hath the Father also. So, the Antichrist are men who deny Jesus. Now, this is again a point of concern at this point of time. Because there are people who are totally against Christ would say they are for Christ well if you remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 not everyone who say Lord Lord shall enter into the kingdom of God so there are those who are not as of kingdom of Christ would say to Christ Lord Lord that makes it difficult isn't it so one may say I believe in Jesus and I don't belong to Christ here I'll give you another example Today, there are many Christian leaders, or so-called Christian leaders, who say, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe He's the Son of God, but I also believe there is other ways of salvation through other gods. Mm. And then you say, you are an antichrist. The man will be very angry with you. He said, Why, how dare you say, I'm an antichrist, when I already so clearly said, Jesus is the Son of God. I said to you, Jesus is the Son of God, but there are other ways of salvation. That's all. Look, I didn't deny Christ. Yes, you did. When you said there are other Christ or other way of salvation, you are saying that God has prepared other ways of salvation when He didn't. The plan of salvation is in Christ Jesus. Election of God is in Christ Jesus. The redemption plan is in Christ Jesus. He is the only Savior of the world. So if you say you believe in Jesus and, and, and et, uh, embrace some other forms of so-called salvation, then you do not really acknowledge Christ as the Father wants you to acknowledge Him. You see, the point is this. It's not good enough for one to say, this is how I think of Christ. It's important for one to say, I believe everything God the Father has said about Christ. Nothing more, nothing less. If you ever have an opinion about Christ that differs, even in the slightest degree, from that which God has revealed about His Son, then you are an antichrist. Is that clear? Only those who subscribe to the doctrine of Christ as God has revealed it can be true followers of Christ, can be called Christians in the real sense of it. Anyone who would distort the doctrine of Christ, even with the slightest degree of twist to the doctrine that God has revealed through the apostles, then that person is an antichrist. 
Many of them would deny the deity of Christ. That's why in verse 22, John said, Who is a liar but he that denied that Jesus is the Christ? The word Christ means the anointed one of God, the one whom God has anointed to be our Savior. There's only one Christ, not two. God has anointed only one to be our Savior. That's Jesus. So if you deny the absolute deity and the messianic uh, nature of Christ, then you are an antichrist. And if you deny the doctrine of Trinity, I believe you are an antichrist. Because the Bible clearly says here, he is the antichrist that denied the Father and the Son. That relationship, that equality of deity in Christ's nature cannot be denied. If you deny that, then you are an antichrist. In this regard, every so-called religious groups, uh, such as Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, all who deny the Trinity are to be rejected as false Christ. Children don't fall into prey of those so-called elders who meet you in bus stops, agents of Satan. Keep away from them. In verse 23, John says, because of the denial of Christ and the Trinitarian relationship of Godhead, they do not inherit the Savior. Listen, he said, Whosoever denied the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledged the Son hath the Father also. So if you deny the truth about Christ, that he is one with the Father, and he is the only Christ whom Father sent, you do not have God. God is not in every religion, as people say. Let me make it very clear, and I'm willing to pay the price with my life, for there is no other truth. If this would be the only chance I would have ever to preach, then let it be known to you once and for all. God is not found in all religions. Only in Christ you have God and His salvation. It is an absolutely dangerous statement to make that every religion leads to God. It is the spirit of Antichrist. How sad it is that leaders of Christianity today compromise and negotiate and enter into uh, uh, debates and discussion to see the middle ground. How can there be middle grounds? Look, my dear friends, the third characteristic of these Antichrist, verse 26. John says very clearly, These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. These are seductive people. They seduce you. They will not take you all of a sudden. They will come as nice, trustworthy people. Slowly they will win your trust and infiltrate your soul with the wrong doctrines. And I pray such will have no part in our midst. But I cannot always guarantee that. If they ever enter, oh dear children of God, let this warning be heard in your ears every day. Protect yourself against them. Now that's our last section of the message. Safeguarding against Antichrist. We have seen the dangers. We have seen the reality and the identity of these dangers. Now let's look at the way God would safeguard us. And we better learn this as quickly as possible. The first means of God's protection for God's people against the Antichrist is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is not here with us physically. But he has sent his blessed spirit to us. Two verses bear witness to this truth. Verse 20 and verse 27. Let's look into verse 21st. Would you please take a look? Verse 20. 
but ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. And look at verse 27. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. And ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Look at the word unction and anointing. In verse 20 you have the word unction, and in verse 27 you have the word anointing. Both come from the same Greek word. They mean the same. The Greek word is chrisma. Now the word chrisma means something that is smeared on. Something that is sprinkled on us. God has sprinkled His Spirit upon us. He has sent the Spirit upon us. See that's what John says in verse 20. But ye have, you brethren, you have an unction from the Holy One. That's God. From God we have an unction. So the word unction refers to who? The Holy Spirit. Every one of us have the unction. You know, this is really fake. When somebody tells you, come here, let me lay my hands on you so you will have the anointing. You tell him, you go home, I already have the anointing. The moment I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, I have what? The anointing. I have the unction. You see, John didn't say, oh good, all of you in the church who, who have the laying of hands from me, you got the unction. Did he say that? No. He has said it in general with regard to all the believers in the church. Ye have an unction from the Holy One, not from the pastor. <laughs> from God the Almighty. Praise God. You know, Christians, there is no need for us to be feeling so small and frightened. Let's remember whether there will be antichrist or antichrists, no matter how many of them are there, we have the omnipotent and the spirit with us. Their blessings are upon us. How wonderful. Ye have an unction from the Holy One. And then he says, you know all things. Whoa, what a statement. You know all things. True believers know what is right and what is wrong. Everything God wants you to know, the Holy Spirit will teach you, my brother. You know, even when a Christian walks into sin, he knows he is sinning, right? Even when he stubbornly walks into sin and engage in it, the Lord never gives him peace. The Holy Spirit will prick him. And he pray all kinds of prayer. Lord, this must be the last time. No more, Lord. All kinds of prayer. He will pray because the Holy Spirit will tell him this is wrong. And the moment the Lord acts to cause him to repent, he quickly repents. Why? You know all things. The Holy Spirit is working. Dear children of God, there are churches that teach all kinds of weird ungodly worldly doctrines when you're in their midst you know that something is wrong isn't it something is really wrong some of you ignorantly stayed in those churches and you thought that's real but when the Holy Spirit started to teach you according to the truth you realized how wrong they were well we praise God for the anointing of the Holy Spirit now look at verse 27 I need to say a word or two about this. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. Praise God, the Holy Spirit never leaves us. He abides in us, and ye need not that any man teach you. Oh, so why are you sitting here listening to me? It must be wrong. You know, there's something wrong here, isn't it? No, no, nothing wrong, nothing wrong. Let me explain to you. Who gives pastors and teachers in the church? The Holy Spirit, right? He is the one who appoints men in the leadership, in the pastorate, or as elders, that they may feed the flock. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives us the gift to teach. So you must have teachers. Then why did John say you, you do not need a teacher? Well, what he is saying that, look, even when you listen to a human teacher in the church, 
Well, you don't just listen to him without the help of the Holy Spirit. You know, I want to say this. Don't you believe anything I say if the Holy Spirit does not help you to understand that. Don't say, I believe because Pastor Koshi says. Now, I've told the story of a young man who went to the church and somebody asked, why did you go to church? Oh, because I like to go to church. You believe? Yes, I believe. Why do you believe? I believe everything the church believes. What does the church believe? The church believes what I believe. So why do you both believe? We believe the same thing. Now, that kind of thinking is very weird. You shouldn't be here because of that kind of uh, logic. It's a common logic that is being explained everywhere. But look, we are here because the Holy Spirit showed us the truth. Amen? It should be the way. That should be the way. If the Holy Spirit does not convict your heart, then you shouldn't be here. Well, we thank God the Holy Spirit never leave us so we can be seduced by some eloquent teachers or some charismatic people. You know, if you look at Benny Hinn, for example, wow, he's, he's got lots of charisma. He wears white, white suit, Rolex watch, diamond ring, gelled hair, nothing wrong about it. But anyway, he looked very handsome. He sings well. He tells you he can make you a multimillionaire. People come in big, big crowd. And it's amazing to sit in this audience and listen to him. Well, I don't mind to be the ugliest looking teacher in the world. As long as the Spirit of God is with me to teach. I don't mind that I'm not the most eloquent person around the world. As long as I preach the truth accurately. I don't mind. People don't like the way I present the truth. As long as I present the truth. I pray to the Lord. And you must pray for me too. Okay. That Holy Spirit will be my teacher. And I will only say. What the Spirit of God would allow me to teach. And you must thank God that the Spirit of God is with you so you will know the truth. This is a great blessing in the time of much seduction, isn't it? This is a great comfort. Let's thank God for the presence of the Holy Spirit and yield to the Spirit, walk in the Spirit that you may be protected by the Lord. Dear brethren, the second safeguard that the Lord gives to us is the knowledge of the truth. The Holy Spirit is here to teach us the truth. And when we have the truth, we must appreciate the truth. Don't disregard it. Embrace it. Cherish it. Meditate upon it. Go back and think about it. The other day, one of the sisters in our church printed out all the sermon outline I put up in the website. And on Tuesday night, she said, Pastor, you see, I'm going to read again. I want to know all this more. Praise God. And one brother called me the other day and said, Pastor, you'll be surprised. I've downloaded all these and given to my friends. And I also make copies of the, uh, our church bulletin articles. Because there are many churches, they have all this portion, poem, but they don't have the substance, the truth. It's a sad thing. How, 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 how much you cherish the truth? You must cherish the knowledge of the truth, you know. You see, in verse 21, John said, I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but ye because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. You see, one of the reasons Paul say, John says, I write unto you not because you don't know, but because you know. So we together affirm the truth. Do you know something? You don't come to church because you don't know anything. Holy Spirit has already taught you many wonderful things, right? In fact, more than 90% of the things that I said today are known to most of you who have been in the church for quite a long time. Isn't that right? But the fact that you sit there and say, praise the Lord, uh, this is the kind of truth that I must hear. This is the kind of church where I must come to help the preaching to go on, the truth to be declared. Well, by that very agreement you have with the truth that is declared, you worship your God and you declare war against Antichrist. 
We must come not only because we don't know anything, but also because we know and we together affirm the truth. And that's what John said. And that's how we protect ourselves against the spirit of Antichrist. The more we hear, the more we affirm our faith, the lesser opportunity the Antichrist will have to penetrate our souls. And he also said the same fact in verse 24. Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye shall continue in the Son and in the Father. If you abide in the things that you have learned from the beginning, from the apostolic doctrines, then you can be sure you are a child of God. You abide in the Son and abide in the Father. The third safeguard is the promise of Christ. Verse 25 tells us we must hold on to Christ's promise of eternal life. And this is the promise that he had promised us even eternal life. We don't need any other way. We don't need any other philosophy. We have complete forgiveness of our sin and even eternal life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Yes, Jesus is enough. Only Jesus. Always Jesus. No one else. Hold on to that promise. Let no one, no intelligent philosopher of the world ever whisper into your ear, Jesus is not the only way. Look at Billy Graham. He also thinks there are other ways of salvation. Why must you be the only one who hold on to it? One day, the political and religious leaders will drag you into court and ask you questions such as this. When all the religious leaders of the world would agree that there, is, there are many different ways to God, why you, silly one, still hold on to the fact that only Christ? You say this, this verse, this is the promise that he had promised us even eternal life. None else did that but my Lord. Cling on to Christ's promise. Finally, at the end of verse 27, the fourth means of safeguarding us, simple and straightforward, short and succinct, ye shall abide in him. Abide in Christ. If you believe in the promises of the Spirit of God through the truth of God's word that grants you eternal life, you will always abide in him. Neither the Antichrist that is to come and the spirit that worketh through the many Antichrists, we will be destroyed. We will be protected by the love of God who said, no man can pluck you out of my hand. That's our safety. So let us praise the Lord for this wonderful truth that he has taught us today.